The pharmaceutical industry is a complex and fascinating field. It takes countless of people to bring a high quality product to the market. In the Qualitox podcast, I bring to you leaders, experts and innovators who will share their experiences and explain to us how they do it. Welcome to the Qualitox podcast. I'm Ian Kugel, your host, and my guest today is Jose Sergio Avila. He has more than 20 years of experience performing validations in the pharmaceutical and the medical devices industries. We'll talk a lot about validation today and about the challenges in the field. Sergio will also give us tips how to stay current in the industry and what it takes to become an expert in the field. Hi Sergio, I'm really glad that uh, you came on the podcast. I'm uh, really excited to have you here. I see uh, that you have a new job, quite uh, fresh. Yes. What are you doing there? Is Metronic Tijuana, and I am a sterilization engineer. I'm in charge of ethylene oxide sterilization, gamma sterilization, and to release lots of our products. Okay, which uh, what products uh, do you release there? Medical devices, um, mm-hmm. catheters. Mm-hmm. So equipment for surgery and the catheters for uh, surgery. Yes. So you're responsible for the validation of the processes? For sterilization processes. For the sterilization. So are you doing the validation or you're just in charge of the whole uh, operation? I am responsible for the validation of sterilization process. I have to validate the ETO sterilization, Mm -hmm. the loads. The models, I have to go to the sterilization facilities to validate the, the loads, the cycles. That's the same for the gamma irradiation facilities too. So Sergio, so uh, what exactly do you validate there? The equipment of the, the sterilization or uh, the process and the, the sterilization for each equipment that you sterilize? We have to qualify both. In fact, the supplier makes the IQ. The OQ and PQ depends on the process of sterilization and the load you are going to process in that equipment. In the e sterilization, you have to validate every chamber of the that you are going to use to, to sterilize your product. In the gamma, you have to validate even the way that you are packing the, the product because it affects the density and how the gamma radiation pass through the product and the packing material. All these parameters has to be established in your validation. If you have only three or four boxes per pallet or even 12 or 15, you have to validate all that stuff, even in ETO or gamma. This kind of sterilization depends a lot of the density of your product, the plastic material, the boxes that you are going to use, the way these are being formed when you pack in, all this effect and all this you have to establish in your validation. You said that the package really impacts how the product is sterilized and the quality of the sterilization. Yes. So you need to test various packages from various suppliers to find the right parameters? No, you establish your your packing and your product. If you have different distribution, you have to pick the one you are going to use in a routine. And that's the configuration you have to challenge to your process. The density of the packing affects the way the radiation or the ATO pass through the packing, go to the product and sterilize. It's Sergio, so uh, let's say uh, go a bit back. You're doing the validations for quite a long time, right? You have uh, you're working in this uh, for 20 years in the pharmaceutical industry and also in medical devices. Is that uh, correct? Yes, I started in pharmaceutical industry in parenteral production. I used to work in a pharmaceutical company where there was process of freeze drying production. We make an uh, aseptic feeling of Oncologic, that's where I started to work. And after that, I went to environmental monitoring for 10 years. 
we used to monitor the critical system of a pharmaceutical, HVAC, compressed air, water for injection, purified water. All these are critical systems for the product because all affect directly to the quality of your or the product, uh, microbiological or chemically. So what are the most critical parameters that uh, you would uh, check? In a parenteral, the water for injection because it has a direct impact in the health of the consumer and in the quality of the product you are administering. Okay, and uh, how do you, t- do you determine this? There is pharmacopoeical parameter established. The water for injection is a high purity water. I think every pharmacopoeia in the world has a, a specification. The critical ones are conductivity, pH, and total organic carbon, and of course, microbiology and endotoxin. These five are the critical ones for every water for injection system. And the water for injection has its own requirements. Since the material, you have to use uh, stainless steel to make a system where the water for injection is produced and you have to keep in a way that it can be contaminated by microorganisms. So you have to take in account a lot of factors as the sanitary pump that has been to be installed to keep the system in movement, because if the water stops, it can be a opportunity to microorganisms to contaminate that system. You have to sanitize the system. You can use chemicals or heat to sanitize. In fact, are more popular the self-sanitizing systems. You have to put the water in a temperature bigger than 50 Celsius degrees to avoid the microorganism pollution. And there is a lot of requisites to keep this water safe for the products. So what are the biggest mistakes that uh, people do when they uh, perform uh, validation on such water systems? When you sample the water, you open the valve, and if it's not um, sanitary, you have a chance to, to pollute the system. If the water doesn't comply with the microbiology, it contaminates all, and you have to start again. And there is three phases to qualify a water for injection or a high purity system. The first one uh, lasts two weeks at minimum. The second phase also has to last two weeks at minimum. And the third phase lasts one complete year to evaluate how the source water or the dwell water affects your system. Only after one year and more, you are sure or you qualify all these critical systems. And are you allowed to use it uh, already for production? After the first phase, you are um, allowed to use in production. So after one week, if you uh, validated it and the results were satisfactory, you can use it already in production, but you have to monitor it closely. Yes, with our two weeks at least. Mm-hmm. With two, uh, two weeks. Uh, okay, I see. Yeah. Yeah, so, so water is really important. I see a lot of uh, FDA warning letters sent to companies that uh, um, violate those uh, requirements. And you mentioned that uh, the requirements are stated in the pharmacopoeia. So you live in Mexico, right? Yes. And uh, which uh, pharmacopoeia do you follow there? Pharmacopoeia de los Estados Unidos Mexicanos. They really work closer to the USP. So the parameters are almost the same. So it, it is uh, the uh, Health State Department of, uh, of Mexico, the COFEPRIS. COFEPRIS. In fact, there is another commission. There is a commission for the Pharmacopeia, Comisión Permanente de la Pharmacopeia de los Estados Unidos Mexicanos. And there is another, as you say, COFEPRIS, es Comisión Federal para Evitar el Riesgos Sanitarios. It uh, sounds uh, much more complicated than FDA. Yes, <laughs> sounds more complicated. But already both uh, commission works for the pharmaceutical and medical device industry to regulate it. Oh, both uh, 
Commission of Pharmacopeia and Coffee Priest work to regulate our medical devices and pharmaceutical industry. You said that you work according to the Mexican Pharmacopeia, but if your products are sold uh, to the worldwide market, to the USA, to Europe, do you have also to test according to uh, their Pharmacopeia or is it uh, uh, harmonized in, uh, um, in such a good way that it uh, fits all the standards uh, across the world? When you sell your products to another country, you have to ask to the regulatory body of that country to come to Mexico and make an audit to that facility. So uh, if somebody wants to purchase from your company, they have to come, they have to audit. It's, um, it makes sense, but you don't have to test according to their pharmacopoeias if they require it. Of course, if you want to sell, you have to test according to the pharmacopoeia or the place where you want to sell the product. In fact, yeah. if you want to sell to US, you have to test according to USP. Or if you want to sell to Japan, you, you, have, you have to test to Japanese pharmacopoeia. What is the biggest market uh, for uh, Mexico? Nowadays, is the US. But I know in Tijuana, there is a lot of importation to Japan and to Asia. And uh, you have a lot of cooperation with the USA on the production and technology. Yes, many industries of the Tijuana are multinational and the cooperatives are in the US. So the technological intercambi are routinary because they come to see how are we making the technological transference. Yeah, because I said, so uh, you, you, you live in Baja, California, so it's uh, really near to the Silicon Valley, right? Right. Mm -hmm. All the companies transfer lines to Tijuana and teams of engineers comes to U.S. and people from U.S. comes here to transfer that lines and to adapt to the technology that we have here or to, to make new technology here. So they uh, do tech transfer from the USA to Mexico or uh, the other way around? Yes. The technology transfer from US mm -hmm. to Mexico. But in some cases, we make some changes for the people that is going to use here in Tijuana. So they, uh, they develop some products in the USA, but it, is, uh, it costs less money to manufacture the same medical devices in uh, Mexico. So they... Uh, collaborate with Mexican companies and do tech transfer so the production can take uh, uh, place there. Yes. You said that uh, you worked on water systems. What's, uh, what, uh, what else uh, have you uh, validated uh, in your long career? HVAC systems, compressed air systems, semi-solid process, medical device process. Medical devices are um, a little bit different because you have to use a lot of plastic so you use molding, injection machines, and you have to validate that process to get the pieces. And after that, you have uh, many times a lot of assembly. The assembly depends practically of the person that they're going to make it. So you have to qualify the person. And if the assemblies are really complicated, you have to trust a lot and to capacitate that person a lot. And overall, to test teach them that the health of a person depends really in them. The welding is made in the same factory, but the operators are the key factor on that case. So those are company employees and they have to be uh, trained very well because the welding has a, a lot of impact on the quality then. Yes. How mm -hmm. long does it take to, uh, to train such an operator? It depends on the complexity of the process. Many times, one week or two weeks are used to capacitate the people because they have to be capacitated in the behavior of unclean rooms since the governing technique and the process of assembly of welding or molding. All this process, in all the, this process, the people has to be capacitated and it takes one or two weeks to get a people that is certified in the process as is, that is going to work. So it's, it seems quite a fast, two, three weeks. So those people usually come with some uh, prerequisite uh, 
experience and qualification. What qualification must you have to work in the, this uh, line of business? Uh, the behavior in clean rooms, because most of the medical devices are manufactured in clean rooms. So the people have to know how to go and how to behave, wash their hands. They don't have to speak a lot of, inside the clean room. Avoid to speak over over the medical device, and they have to know that the microbiological evaluation plates don't be touched because many times the people that are new see the dishes and try to touch them, and that's for the microbiology lab. It's a disaster because they contaminate the dish. In some cases, the people have to learn how to manage the medical device. Overall, when it's a orthopedical or it's a class one medical device that has to be a lot of control, we use laminar flow hoods where we manage these devices and these devices must not be taken out of the laminar flow hood. What is more complicated to validate pharmaceutical systems or uh, the production of medical devices? Can you compare it? Yes. In fact, validation is the same to document that your process gives you a product on a specification. So you have to analyze the medical device process. I can tell you that molding has uh, many parameters, pressure, temperature of the plastic, uh, the mold, all this has to be in control to get a plastic piece that is going to be used in the medical device at its satisface. The assembly has to be also verified. There is a lot of tests and we have to validate that test. Just as in pharmaceutical are make the analytical techniques validation, in medical device you have to make a lot of gaps method validation to see that the measure of the plastic are on a specification, all that stuff is comparable. So although there is difference, we have uh, big equalities and all this stuff is to make us and document that the medical device satisfies all the requisites. What is the most difficult thing that you have validated in your career? I think Critical system of pharmaceutical are the hardest thing to validate because in medical device, most of the time you have a sterilization process at the end or you have a security that at the end, the ETO or the gamma irradiation is going to make the process sterile. But in the case of pharmaceutical, you have to take care a lot of the product to protect it in the clean room, in the filling, and even the personnel is more dedicated in the pharma industry. The product is more delicate in the pharma than in the medical device. So it's hardest, and the critical system in pharmaceutical are, are really more hard things to validate. So, uh, but uh, for example, in medical device, uh, you say that you can sterilize it in the end. But if it malfunctions, for example, it's some uh, implant or, for example, a hard pacer, the sterilization will, won't help if something goes wrong with the battery or uh, uh, the way the appliance works. How do you insure yourself against that? Uh, in that cases, you have a, a lot of statistical and risk analysis to see what can go wrong and avoid in case of the batteries, you have a lot of tests to make to assure that the battery is going to work well on the lifetime that it has a specific. Or what can you do to avoid any problem with the battery or the conductivity of the wires or another electronic stuff that you are going to use in that device? So in the, in the medical industry, when you manufacture a batch of 10,000 pills, you don't test all of them. You test the uh, is a small amount because if you test them, they are destroyed. So you, you really need to make sure that the process is correct. But I guess in med with medical devices, it's a bit uh, different uh, or isn't it? Do you uh, test each device after manufacturing? No, or we have also a statistical control. You have to test some 
uh, parameters of the electronic stuff, but the AQLs or the safety of the statistical must be higher than in some and other industries. It's not the same to a sampling plan for uh, food that for a medical device. So the uh, confidence must be higher in the statistical. Maybe you have to test three times that in another industry, but it's not at 100%. So in the medical devices field, uh, you're working according to uh, Six Sigma? Yes, we use a lot of statistical tools. We use Six Sigma, we use Pipe S, we use sampling plants, and we try to use a lot of all that stuff to get um, the best result that we can get from our process. We have confidence levels, and these statistics are agree with the confidence level that we need for that kind of medical device. More critical, more confidence we must use. Can you give me a number uh, that is usually used? We use AQLs or bigger than 95% than in other industries use only 95%. We use 95 is the lower and for the highest we use 99%. Do you know about cases where a device malfunctioned? In a company when where I used to work, there there was a problem because it was a respiratory circuit and the air has to be warmed up before they go to the patient. And the the wire that that was used to to warm up it was not welding according to the to the process and the patient has problems of infection because the air was not um, correctly wore up or humidified to the process of breath. That was one case. In the case of implants, I have I have no personal experience with that stuff. It's good news that you didn't encounter uh, many such uh, malfunction devices. It uh, means that the industry is in the right direction and they use uh, the right tools. One of two months ago, the Environment Agency in the U.S. questioned all the sterilization firms as Stergenics, Steris, in the ETO facilities that they could be pollution in the air near to the place where they work. And FDA defending that these Firms work with a lot of medical device, and if they are um, closed, the medical device industry can be in crisis because they are not going to be able to satisfy the demand of medical devices, the sterile medical device in the US. So FDA also has to ask the industry to start with a new ways of sterilized medical device not only gamma or ETO or X-ray, they have to propose a new ways of get a, medi- a sterile medical okay, device. So they're still thinking about it. So they haven't decided which way they're still uh, uh, considering uh, which way would be the, a good replacement. No, they have no have a good replacement yet because ETO is the easiest and cheapest way of sterilizing medical devices yet. So, it's, so you said that uh, uh, pollution, the air pollution, affects the um, process of sterilization. Yes. So it has uh, such a big impact. Yes. You manufacture your product, pack it, and send to the centers of sterilization. That's another firms, and there, that products are sterilized by exposing to ethylene oxide or gamma irradiation. Those and other facilities has been questioned by the environmental agency in the U.S. because ETO, as you know, is a cancer region. They are afraid of the effects of ETO in the environment. Although the sterilization firms control the ETO that can be released from the installation, the environmental question, I think is right. We have not been exposed to ETO 
would FDA says what happened with that process or that medical device because ETO is nowadays the easiest and cheapest way of make a sterile the medical device. So we have to make another ways to get a sterile medical device. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge, I guess, uh, nowadays, but the technology moves uh, quite uh, quickly. So uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, in uh, your field of validation, where really technology moves very quickly, and, uh, really fast, how do you keep up with all the new regulation and you stay uh, current? You have to save time and read to consult the international regulations. I really take uh, one week at the one hour per week to review what's new in the regulation of Europa, uh, FDA, or pharmaceutical international cooperation scheme. You know that they are also, I think, the three bigger regulatory bodies in the world. So you have to read, uh, read technology magazines. What uh, magazines and the podcasts would you recommend uh, for people in this field to keep uh, up with the standards? Uh, pharmaceutical technology, green room technology, medical device online, the Scottish Society of Clean Rooms, Microbiology Forum. I follow James Sakayoko. He's one of the most important person in the regulation of pharmaceutical or medical device industry. So you really need to keep studying and uh, at least one hour per week, you should invest your time as uh, you do to keep uh, with uh, the current regulation and really become an expert in the field. What are the biggest uh, mistakes that uh, people do when they do a validation? I think to not to follow in a correct or uh, right way what is written in the protocol. Sometimes they only think, uh, I have to take a sample on these times and they don't think why they have to take that samples. If it depends on the process, or what parameter are they evaluating? They must be very clear on why they are going to take a sample or to evaluate some process. If you know the process, you can establish a very good protocol and to assure really that you are validated that, that process. There is people that is dedicated to molding. They took a lot of courses to get the, the reason on molding process, the molding when I started to work in medical device, I, I really used to think it was an easy process, but it is not. It depends a lot of factors to get a piece in a really good shape and that satisfies all the parameters of shape, dimension, uh, rugosity. Sometimes you have to test with air, and if the piece is not very well processed, it can be exploded or broke in some cases, if you don't know the really the molding process, you cannot get a, a medical device that satisfies all your specifications. So you mentioned that uh, most of the mistakes occur because people don't follow the instructions uh, correctly, right? Uh, are there also problems that uh, result from a, a bad plan and... Um, uh, some parameters that were uh, not uh, taken into account during uh, the risk assessment? Yes. First, people must know the process and after that, write a very good protocol and instruct the people that is going to perform the validation. Most know why they are testing some parameters and taking the samples in a correct way because... Mm -hmm. And if the process is completely new? When the process is completely new, you have to use design of experiments to evaluate what are the process that's it, that is going to be a key in your process. Using that kind of statistical evidence, you can minimize the risk to mistakes and to know better your process. You are going to use more samples with the, at the end you are going to know better your process. That's the key of a successful validation. What tips would you give to uh, people who are new to the industry and uh, want to become uh, real experts? The first tip is to know a lot of GMPs, 
to try to be conscious that our product affect the health or even the life of persons. Yeah, always imagine the, pa the, the patient on the other side. Yes, the medical device or the pharmaceutical product that they are, they are going to use must be safe for the use. We must be sure that the product is not going to affect the health of that people. So know the process. It must be a chemical process, a pharma process, a medical device process. You must know, know all the parameters that affect your process, temperature, pressure, even the people, because in the assembly of medical devices, you must to convince the people that they work is really important. All that stuff must be in the mind of the person that is going to work in a validation or, or the medical or pharmaceutical industry. And that it never ends because the regulations change every day. You must be learned a lot of the new regulation, it must be in software validation, uh, clean rooms, process, clinical, all that stuff must be learned by the person that is going to work in medical device or pharma industry. Okay, Sergio, thank you very much for those uh, precious uh, tips. And I hope that uh, people who uh, want to work in the industry, they always uh, think about the patient or uh, the consumer that is on the other side and always keep learning uh, from the books, the magazines, uh, the media, and also from each other. Because I think experience and the uh, more experienced uh, colleagues are uh, the best teachers. Thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, accepting my invitation to be on the podcast. Thank you. I appreciate a lot your invitation. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Qualitox podcast. If you did, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss new episodes. Stay compliant and see you in the next one.